Welcome back to Philosophy for Flourishing, the show where we explore principles and practices for living the best, most fulfilled life possible. Today, I'm speaking with a friend of mine, author, philosopher, and teacher, Dr. Andrew Bernstein. And we're here to talk about education, which is just an incredibly important topic for human flourishing, both at a personal level for each of us, but really, if we're thinking about the future, the future is the kids that are in schools today. And so Dr. Andrew Bernstein, author of this recent book, see if I can get the lighting just right on it. There we go. Why Johnny still can't read or write or understand math and what we can do about it. So obviously there's a story behind that title, but I'm going to let you tell it. Thank you so much for joining me, Andy. Well, thanks for having me on, John. So it's always good talking to you, whether it's the hero show or philosophy for flourishing, because I, as I remember, you interviewed me on, on, on your show once before when my book on heroes came out, right? That's right. Yeah, that was, that was that, and I think we discussed literature once also. But anyhow, it's always good talking to you. And yeah, there is a, there is a story there. Uh, 1955, Rudolf Flesch wrote a famous book called Why Johnny Can't Read. And he was an Austrian immigrant and he knew there were no remedial reading problems in, in most of Western Europe. There hadn't been his research showed there had been none in the United States, or very few anyway. Prior remedial to, reading problems, meaning yeah. Yeah, teaching kids, adults kids, how to read or uh, no, the kids struggling, mm -hmm. kids struggling to read and, and continuing to struggle when when they became adults. So there were very few in Europe and in the United States prior to World War I. After World War I, you see a big uptick in kids struggling to read. And Flesch did his homework and he showed that the school system uh, had, had done away with phonics, or was trying to do away with phonics, the uh, tried and true method of teaching reading where you teach the kids the out letters of the alphabet, the sounds the letters make, the sounds that the combinations of letters make, you know, systematic phonics, and then they could, they, by the time a kid's four or five years old, the overwhelming majority, you know, thousands of words, you know, verbally in their mother tongue. And, and when you teach them phonics, now they can match the verbal symbols they already know. They can sound out the literary symbols on the page. They can match it with the verbal symbols they already know. It's a very, very effective method of teaching reading. Has been in many places for a long time. And the American school system was arguing against it. They were, they were trying to push it aside for, you know, what they call the whole word method, which doesn't work. And that, that's why Flesh wrote his book, Why Johnny Can't Read. What you're saying in this book is not only was this the case in the 50s, it's still the case today. And it's also the case that they can't do math and they don't understand literature or history. What's going on? How, first, how do we measure this thing? How do we know that there's still a problem here? I've heard this thing called the National Report Card. Maybe you could just give us a little bit of an idea of what the results have been, what the trends have been in the time since the 50s. Yeah, it's the trend line, unfortunately, has been downward. The National Assessment of Educational Progress, that's what they, they call the nation's report card. It's just abysmal. The most recent, they do it every two years. The most recent scores I saw were the 2019 scores where you know, in, in, for uh, reading and, and math, what was, I think, they, they test fourth and eighth graders, starting from a very low baseline. The scores generally went down. The only place where the scores went up was in math. I think for the fourth graders went up from 240 out of 500 to 241. Now, I was never the world's best math student, but even I know 240 out of 500 is 48 percent. That's an abysmally failing score. Uh, this is how bad the math skills are of most American kids and the, the reading scores are terrible. Whether it's on the NAP test nationally or the PISA test internationally, the American kids score poorly. By the way, I don't want to depress people, but if you saw the, the news out of Project Baltimore not so long ago where you had so many high school kids, many kids in high school were reading at first grade levels, first grade for the high school kids. That's heartbreaking. This is not uncommon. I teach college kids. I know how uneducated these poor, good kids. I love these kids. They're good American kids, but they've been robbed of the education that they should have. And it's not that difficult for, the, for schools to provide. 
So not only have the, the statistics trended in this direction, but it sounds like your own personal experience as a teacher in the classroom, you've seen this firsthand. What have you seen? Yeah, I've been, I've been in the classroom for the most part, most of my life, K through 12 public schools or government schools, I think. Uh, public schools is a euphemism, right? All private schools are open to the public. They're government schools. I went K through 12 government schools in Brooklyn, you know, then in, in college, then in grad school. And I was teaching. I've been in education almost my entire life. What I, what, now looking back on it now, John, I can see, though, the schools when I was a kid, everybody likes to, you know, yeah. I'm an old timer now. You know, old timers are off. Yeah, old timers are off. Ah, everything was better when I was a kid. You know, you, you, we've all heard that all, all our life. Looking back on it, as honestly and objectively as I can now, with what I know about education, I would say the schools that I went to were better, were better than today, but they weren't good. They could have been made so much better, and they've gotten worse. I've seen it 40 years in the classroom. I've seen, yeah, as a teacher, I mean, I've seen the abilities go down for one example is i've taught many ethics courses in my career at any number of different colleges i've generally used the fountainhead my favorite book you know uh, as as a, as a textbook in 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 the ethics classes for many years like 30 years i used the fountainhead five six years ago i stopped the kids reading abilities just the mechanics of reading had deteriorated to the point where they struggled just to read the book, never mind with reading comprehension. So I had to stop using the, the fountainhead in, in my ethics courses. I also, had to, I also had to stop giving essay tests because it broke my heart to read the things that these poor kids wrote. I, they, they struggled, John, they struggled to write a coherent paragraph. Most of them can't write a, never mind, you know, can't, can't even approximate a college level essay. So I stopped giving essay tests and started giving, you know, shorter, shorter answer. To, this is in college philosophy classes. Uh, I want them to read primary sources. There was a time when we did, that was a time I even, I even had the kids read, read Kant. That was a long time ago. Uh, not, no, no more reading, trying to read that Plato, Aristotle, Descartes, Locke, Kant, Marx. No, this just goes over their head. So I've seen the decline in reading abilities writing abilities, which was never great, by the way, but it's, it's gotten worse. And this is going to give you one anecdote about history and the complete ignorance of American history. A couple of years ago, right before the pandemic shut us down, I was in class, 20 kids, all of them born, reared, educated in America. Well, logic is an abstract subject, so I try to tie it to reality with all kinds of examples. I, mean, I want to discuss James Madison. I figured that was a pretty safe example. Turns out it wasn't so safe. 10 out of 20, 50% of American college kids never heard of him, never heard of James Madison. 10 of them knew, 10, 10 had heard of him. They knew he'd been a past president. Zero of 20 knew that he was the lead author of the U.S. Constitution and virtually the sole author of the Bill of Rights. You're indicating here the importance of knowing history. I know that there's been this other school of thought in education that I think we should we should dive into that says, well, it's not so important that kids know these facts about history. What are they going to do with it? How are they going to use that? How is that going to be useful in their lives? What they need is to learn how to use an iPad or work amongst other people in a social setting. What they need are, are other values that this sort of traditional approach to education doesn't doesn't give. So I'm wondering, could you flesh out this view a little bit and tell us what you think about it? Well, first of all, let's start with history, because that's what we were discussing. And I'll start with the famous quote from George Santayana, you know, who was a philosophy professor at Harvard. I don't remember the exact wording, but it was, you know, those who were ignorant of history are doomed to repeat its errors. So, you know, or, or something to, to that effect. Well, that's exactly right. You know, I always tell the kids, because they don't know any history, and I bring in historic examples to try and, you know, one, to have ex examples for my f philosophic principles, and two, to kind of fill in their education a little bit. Where human society is today, or at any point in time, is a direct function of where it's come from in the past. And there's no way to understand the present. 
And I don't mean it's difficult. I mean, it's impossible to understand the present if we don't know the past. And what, you know, for instance, the struggle with jihadists today, you know, and, and you know, especially with, you know, with the Taliban, a member of 9-11, Al-Qaeda, with you know, Osama bin Laden was hiding out in Afghanistan, you know, by the, the Taliban. There's no way to understand that if we don't understand the Cold War Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, American opposition to the Soviet invasion, army and the Mujahideen, you know, the, uh, the Islamic warriors from which the Taliban emerged. And no way to understand the Cold War without understanding the end of World War II and so on and so on, going back, going back into history. And we certainly can't understand the struggle. You know, why, why do they hate us? Why do they blow up American cities? And there's some people, fools, leftists, you know, claim, well, it's blowback for American, you know, American imperialism and American intervention in Iran and all the countries, you know, uh, American support for Israel, all of which I think has some, some truth to it. But if we don't know the history of Islam, Muhammad's lifetime, uh, the Quran, the Hadith, which is the compendium of, you know, sayings and actions ascribed to the prophet, the second most holy book, in uh, Islam, we, we, if, if we do know the history, we'll realize Islam is the one true faith. It's God's final revelation. There's no more revelations after this. It's destined to rule the world. And it's been an endlessly aggressive religion against its, against its enemies. Uh, and when, you know, was quiescent for several. Oh, here's a, a historical tidbit for you. Uh, the Islamic attempt to conquer Europe, in this case, the Ottoman Empire, 1683 the final assault on Vienna. You know, they were halfway from Constantinople to London, uh, which was defeated on September 11th, 1683. That date's been forgotten in the West, but it's remembered by the jihadists. Osama bin Laden did not pick that date out of the hat. He was delivering a message. Jihad had been quiescent for several centuries as the West grew strong, uh, but it, it's back. Be afraid, you know, be very afraid. If we don't know history, we don't know any of this. There's no, way that, there's no way to understand that. No, it's not primarily American imperialism such as it was. It's the nature of Islam, its teachings and its history to conquer its enemies. If we don't know history, we'll never understand. We'll never understand this. And similarly for other subjects, if we, if, if, if we know science, for example, let's take the man-made global warming issue. If we know anything about science, we know the modern war period today was preceded by what they call the Little Ice Age, when the Earth was much colder. Before that was the medieval warm period, roughly 900 to 1300 AD, when it was a lot warmer and the Norse even settled Greenland, grew crops, even thought to name it Greenland. You know, we go before that was the Dark Age, cold period, and so on and so forth. We know the Earth cycles, uh, and that the change in temperature in our day is very modest and it's completely within the bounds of natural variability. And we would say, well, what is all hysteria about? Well, we don't know any science. <laughs> Literature, of course, uh, enables us to appreciate the masters, you know, the beauty of the language, for instance, in Shakespeare, or uh, appreciate these great stories. We just, we just published an essay on learning from tragedy, you know, gaining wisdom on what not to do, you know, in our lives to avert tragedy. Uh, the great writers give us real insight into human nature and human character. I mean, we can go on and on, but mathematical calculation obviously trains the mind, not just in, in, in math, but in, in rigorous thinking, you know, in rigorous logical thinking and so on. So I think this, human beings need basic thinking skills, reading, writing, math, and then they need content, science, literature, history, for example. Uh, and if they have that, I agree with Robert Maynard Hutchins entirely, who was one of the great books guys, who said, you know, employers who do on the job training can, can train, if, if you got somebody who, who had a real education in this regard and has sharp thinking skills, an employer could train them to, to the work they need to do via on the job training in a matter of weeks, maybe months at most. I think that's absolutely true and it's important. Well, that's, I think, a good indication of the value of this content in, in education. And I'm wondering, though, if people really grasp the full extent of the argument against this. And I know from reading your book and your other essays on this topic that there's a long history of thought that opposes this view. Mm -hmm. So and this is important to understand because it's actually 
at the root, as you're talking about, if we don't understand the history, then we can't understand where we are now. So could we unpack a little bit the history of this, this battle over education, the ideas that motivated people to take education in the direction that it, it has gone? Yeah, that's a good question. A little more than 100 years ago, you know, academic education in the United States was outstanding. We have a lot of proxy data showing very high literacy levels. I, my favorite, going back to the revolutionary period, John, is uh, the essays of the Federalist. You know, mm -hmm. Hamilton, Madison, Jay, high level political theory. They were you know, college graduates today overwhelmingly would struggle with the Federalist. Um, they were largely written as newspaper editorials to, you know, for every man, every man. There's a lot of proxy data like that, right up, right up in, through the early 20th century, um, even after the imposition of government schools in the mid 19th century. It starts to change with the rise of the so-called progressive era you know, in the, in the early 20th century. And, and, and uh, uh, you know, the Chinese philosopher Confucius said, the beginning of wisdom is uh, to call things by their right names. <laughs> it always rankles me. There's nothing progressive about socialism. You know, uh, socialists are progressive, they're regressive, and they're certainly not liberals, that is supporters of liberty. And so this, uh, the rise of the socialist mentality in the United States, one, uh, do away with capitalism, want to establish a socialist, if not a communist system in the United States. How are we going to do that? And well, one way that, you know, the IQ test had just come in early 20th century, the Stanford Bernay tests. And one, one way to do that was to IQ test all the kids, find the brightest, and they get the college level. They're on the college track. They get the full academic program. They get math and science and reading and writing and literature and history, and they're going to go to college, and they're society's future leaders, both in the legislature and, and in the classroom. The rest of us, the overwhelming majority of us, we don't need much academic training. We need practical skills, you know, hygiene, driver's ed, you know, sex ed, uh, home ec, you know, things like that. Uh, varsity sports were emphasized. I love sports, but you know, varsity sports were emphasized because, you know, they, they vigorous health and, you know, good, clean competition. Uh, but I think that should be done, you know, after school or out of school. But these are the things that most of us need. You, you know, practical skills, vocational training, metal shop, which I was funny, my, my dad was a metal shop teacher. Um, because we don't need to do that much thinking. The goal here, and, and John Dewey, who's the godfather of this, and if we were going to write a historic novel about the battle to save American education, I think Dewey would be the novel's villain. Uh, Dewey was very clear. You know, most of us don't need uh, academic training. What we need is what we need is two things. One, be good at our job. And two, obey the wise rules of the state. And everybody lives for the state. And, and, and we have a you know, very happy collectivist society where everybody, everybody serves society. And so... Dewey, who taught for many years in the philosophy department at Columbia, William Hurd Kilpatrick, his leading disciple, was head of the uh, Department of, uh, of Educational Philosophy at Columbia University Teachers College, was training many of the teachers back then. They emphasized group projects, cooperation, not just cooperation, but conformity. That is, if your judgment, some kids' independent judgment thought the group's consensus was wrong, He's supposed to just go along with the group. That's, that's what they, they emphasize. In contrast, say, to Maria Montessori, who emphasized independent thinking and the child's independent thinking should be, you know, should be encouraged. So your conformity to the group uh, was emphasized and ultimately, of course, obedience to, to the state. Don't forget, Dewey, Kilpatrick, these guys, where did they go to find the educational system that they admired? They went to the Soviet Union the Soviet Union under Stalin. And they came back with glowing reports about because the Soviet system trained people. They beat, you know, selfish individualism out of the kids and everything was designed to serve, to serve the state. So that's, that's the, the history, the ugly, the ugly history of the anti-academic program. I mean, Dewey said in so many words in his writings on education that um, you, know, I could, you know, learning to read at an early age and gaining academic education when you're young tends 
very naturally to pass into selfishness, that the, the child is then equipped to function independently. There's, there's no social gain there. Um, Got to learn to conform to the group, obey the state, live in a collectivist society. That's the genesis of, of this anti-academic training, and it's, it's ugly. Well, I have to ask as the you know, skeptical modern man, surely ideologues of this consistency and caliber can't still be running the show, right? <laughs> Should we get uh, ideologues of a much worse consistency and caliber are now running the show? Uh, <laughs> for one thing, IQ tests are out because they're racist. Sure, you know. So um, the, you can't IQ test the, the, the kids anymore. But today, it's not so much about, you know, by the way, I just want to point something out. There's a few things. There's still a lot of good classroom teachers in the school system across the country, you know, so, but they get burned out trying to, you know, teach the kids academic subjects that they got to have the battle against the stifling bureaucracy. Uh, but uh, American historian Arthur Bester wrote a book in the 1950s called Educational Wastelands, where he pointed out what he called, he, he called the interlocking directorate, the real power. Well, who's got the power? in the school system. And he pointed out one, the teachers colleges, two, the state departments of education, three, back then what was the forerunner of the federal department of education. Uh, you know, uh, they have the power and they are hardcore leftists. And the goal today is not even the uh, practical skills of vocational training so much, although there's still some, some of that, but there's a lot of leftist propaganda. Today, uh, the idea that there's many different genders, you know, we could choose any gender we want and young children have to be, you know, kindergarten, first grade, they have to be encouraged, choose your gender, you know, little Johnny or Judy, as if, as if this was a choice rather than, you know, a biological fact. Uh, so th th there's choose your gender foisted on the young kids, man-made global warming all through the school system. Uh, America is systemically racist today, like it was a hundred years ago during the Jim Crow era, and white people are inveterately, inherently racist. If they teach American history at all, very often they use Howard Zinn's textbook, A People's History of the United States. Zinn was not just your typical, talk about much worse than Dewey and Kilpatrick. Zinn was not just your typical Marxist professor. According to the FBI, he was a member of CPUSA. He was a member of the Communist Party. And his book is just a communist screed against America. I've read it. I managed to get through it without barfing too many times. Uh, it's a, it, America's evil. It's racist. Capitalism is evil. Communism is, is good. This is a, a lot of what goes on in the school system, which is why the parents were so shocked during the pandemic when they saw, you know, looking over their kids' shoulders, that they saw when they saw one how little education goes on and two, how much indoctrination goes on. And this is why, you know, these 30 year old soccer moms uh, outraged at the school boards, you know, and, you know, and that about what their kids are being quote taught in the schools. And, and of course, these moms who have this funny, and dads too, who have this funny idea that they want little Johnny and Judy to learn how to read and write, and have ma mathematical calculation skills and so on. They're labeled by the Department of Justice as terrorists uh so yeah it's gotten a lot worse it was the uh <clears throat> it was the school board education right the national school school board association that called on the federal government to use the full force of the federal government to uh meet these these terrorists on their own terms right yeah these terrorists who want their kids to get an academic education uh you know the, you know there was a, a survey done just this past summer right around the time my book came out and I, th I think it was done for the a AFT, actually, the American Federation of Teachers, uh, for the parents. A simple question, what do you want? And the parents overwhelmingly responded, what do we want? Academic education, more academic education, less indoctrination. That's what the parents want. That makes them terrorists to, yeah. to the National School Board and the DOJ these days. Yeah, and it, as you bring the light in in this book, and I know that Courtney DeAngelis and other people that are monitoring the educational situation have pointed out that parents 
who want to have any sort of say as to what their their children are learning are denied and and not only denied but but labeled terrorists and and white supremacists yeah what well, so I, some, I, of the, some of the parents are black you know and latino <laughs> but they're white supremacists right it doesn't uh they, they have the false consciousness problem right yeah well the la times labeled larry elder as the black face of white supremacy that's you know, that's the man that's the mentality here it's it's a, it's really it's it's amazing but yeah the parents the parents overwhelmingly still have this idea that they want their kids to get academic education and the, and they're being you know, criticized and abused for it. It's, but there's things that they can do about it, though. So well, that, yeah, that, let's get to that because, as you know, soon I will be joining the realm of parents. Congratulations and, to you and Rose. <laughs> Thank you very much. And what I want to know that you know the, the the meat here is what the hell can we do about this? We have this massive problem. What do we do? The the government schools can't be reformed. Uh, E.D. Hirsch book is very good. Uh, the schools we need and why we don't have them. 1996, I think Hirsch was a uh, may still be a, a humanities professor at UVA. Called the school system an impregnable fortress, can't be conquered, overrun, changed, reformed, altered. So he's right, it can't be. But it can be outflanked. It can be circumvented. And the best thing parents can do is pull their kids from the government schools. Starve the monster of victims, you know, and there's a, and educate the kids at home. There's a lot of there's a lot of advantages to this. Homeschooling is on the rise. Fortunately, it's a, it's a, it's a you know it's a it's a great thing. Uh, homeschool kids tend to score on any metric you want to mention. Uh, similarly to private school, kids go to top private schools much better than the kids that go to the government schools, uh, and you can see why. There's there's generally you know. You're, 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 in, you're in your home, it's a safe environment. The government schools have problems with drugs, with bullies, with crime. And there's usually none of that at, at home. It's a safe environment. Uh, you don't have 30 kids in a class. You have two or three kids generally, mom or dad is, you know, is teaching them. There's, there's a lot of advantages. And I know parents you know, are skeptical. Some parents are skeptical. Uh, you know, I'm not a teacher. I don't have teaching skills. And my response is, well, how good a teacher do you have to be to do a better job than the government schools are doing today? And the answer is not, not much. You don't, you don't have to be that much of a teacher. Or well, we're tired after work and everything, you know, which I understand. But uh, this is your child's edu education. There's a lot of things they can do besides homeschool. One is homeschool co-ops, where parents get together and pool their resources, which... Uh, you know, the real leftist states, the blue states, uh, they have law, they often have laws against this. It depends what state you're in. The, the more conservative states, the redneck places tend to have fewer laws against this. With, you know, and let's give the, uh, as much as I uh, reject religion and repudiate it, faith-based beliefs, it was American Christians who spearheaded, for the most part, the drive towards homeschooling in this country and got it, got it legalized in, in every state. In the country, so you know, three cheers for 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 them for doing that. But uh, uh, in in the more religious areas, more rural areas, those states generally throw fewer roadblocks in your way, and, and you can pull your resources. You know, so this kid's mom, you know, is an engineer, and so she teaches the kids math, and you know, and this kid's dad is an MD, and you know, he teaches biology. You know, you know, and so on. You know, you, you know, they pool their resources and in homeschool co-ops in many states are viable. Um, even in the blue states, you, you have to jump through a lot of hoops, but you, well, you can you can still sometimes at least get it done. But the micro schools, John, and we were just a couple of months ago, we were just at a, you know, at an event. Our good friend Mike Gustafson up in the uh, outside of Lowell, Massachusetts, right? The micro schools are a fascinating phenomenon. What, Atlas what Academy, it, yeah. Yeah, Atlas Academy, yeah. Is, is, is it Dracut? Is that how you say the town? Dracut, Massachusetts? Drake it. Drake it, ah, sorry. Drake it. French. Get that French out of here. <laughs> ah, all right, Drake it's good. Yeah, it's a good Anglo-Saxon. That's a good Anglo-Saxon word, Drake it, uh, Massachusetts. But but um, what they call micro schools are, like I said, there's still a lot of good classroom teachers. 
and they burn out in the, very often in the in the school system. And a number of them have opted out. I, I see it on Facebook all the time. I'm a teacher. I opt out of the system. And with, you know, with several families who are disgruntled with the schools, they form, you know, a, a, what they call a micro school, which is just a small community school and some parents basement, you know, and this is the way the great Marble Collins got started, by the way, you know, uh, you know, with, with four or five kids in a basement, you set up a whiteboard and some chairs. And here's a teacher who wants to, you know, who knows the kids need phonics to teach reading, knows they need to know real American history, not communist propaganda and so on. And this is so widespread a phenomenon, the micro schools, that even Forbes magazines, a business magazine a year or so ago, did an, did an article on it, you know, on the on micro schools. And uh, it's, it's often called the return of the one room schoolhouse, where you have a school mom, could be a man sometimes, but it's often a woman, you know, uh, who's teaching kids, a, you know, a few, she has a small number of students, there may be different grade levels, uh, but she's teaching, she's teaching them real you know, real cognitive subject matter, not prop, not political propaganda. And this is becoming a widespread phenomenon, right? And, and by the way, as uh, with Mike Gustafson in Massachusetts, Massachusetts is one of the bluest of the blue places. Uh, when you're a certified teacher, there's very few hoops they can make you jump through to, to opt out and start your own school. And so the micro schools are a real, I think it's, you know, the big part of the future of American education. And uh, the, you know, the return of the one room schoolhouse. And you know, the good website for that is microschoolrevolution.com. That's, that's one thing, you know, homeschooling, homeschool co-ops, micro schools, and let's not forget tutors. You know, I'm a tutor and, you know, I wrote about tutoring in the book. And here's the good news. Well, maybe I, could I tell the uh, Cliff Note story, John? Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Because this is about teacher training. Um, Let so, me, because you have a, you had a great quote here. I think it's, I just wanted to bring this up in, in the form of a question, because you said the, the education majors come into college academically weaker than most students, and upon graduation, the gap has widened. So why is that? The, the future teachers are, are, are often weaker students than people in other majors. That may be true, and I think there's a lot of research to support it. It's not the problem, though. It's not the main point. They're, they're way smart enough to be able to learn the subject matter, teach, you know, and teach children. Um, the problem is this. Let me, let me use the Cliff Note story to introduce it. It's not, it was 1999-2000. Cliff Notes, are, and everybody knows what Cliff Notes are, right? there. Yeah. study guides for great works of literature. Unfortunately, and they're, they're everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, Cliff Notes are good, and so are Spark Notes, by the way, because they stay, what I like about them is they stay tied to the story. They don't float off, you know, discussing symbolism independent of the story. They stay with the events and the interpretations, uh, meanings of it have to be tied to the events. That's what I like about, about those. You know, they're very, they're very down to earth, common sense study guides. And uh, so Cliff's Notes approached me to write the Cliff's Notes for three Iron Rand titles, Anthem, The Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged. Well, The Fountainhead is my all time favorite book. So, you know, so I said, yeah. And the, uh, the general editor of Cliff's Notes was a really good guy, said to me, you know, it was by email, he said, uh, when we started out, Cliff Notes started out in 1950s, I think early 60s. He said, our main demographic was high school and college kids, you know, who, who were too lazy to read the book or they didn't understand it. They wanted to supplement. Uh, today, our main demographic is high school English teachers who either never read these books when they were in college or worse, they don't understand it. They don't have the, you know, the training to, to understand these books. Why is that? Why is that? And the reason is that in every state in the country, teachers are required to major in education. They have to take tens of hours of education courses, method courses in, in how to teach, uh, not content courses in, in what to teach. So for example, future math teachers are taking significantly fewer math courses than your average math major. They, they know less math than the, you know, than the average math major. Similarly for the English and the science teachers, they're taking so many education courses, they're taking fewer content courses. So they don't know the material. 
uh, in the first place. They know they don't know enough content. And I was saying in the book, look, teacher training is not that difficult. If you, uh, I'm considered a very good teacher. If I if, if, if you were to give me a bunch of graduates, college graduates who really knew their subject, the math, math, science, history, whatever it is, I, I could teach them how to teach in one course. It doesn't take four years of education courses. I would teach them, give lots of examples, tell stories, pull the principles out of the stories, do it inductively. Uh, pull the pull the principles of the subject matter out of out of the stories and the examples that you give. You know, uh, yell if you have to, not in anger, but you know, to generate enthusiasm. Walk around the classroom, put stuff on the board. You know, there's a whole bunch of tips to improve their teaching if they know the subject matter. You got to know you got to know something to teach before you can learn how to teach it. So, uh, this is the tutors. This is another good thing came out of the pandemic, John. Uh, parents are horrified, and, and rightfully so. Now, tutors, you can go to varsitytutors.com is a good source. LinkedIn is, you know, is a good source you know, for this. So I tutor a family in, in Minnesota you know, via Zoom. So you got all these graduate students, colleges all across the country. Hell, today it could be anywhere in the world. You know? And they're studying content courses. So let's say somebody's getting a PhD in biology, let's say at the University of Oregon, and here's a family in Michigan, they're looking for a biology you know, tutor for, the, you know, for their kids. Well, the, the PhD student, one, has a degree in biology, not in education, already knows more biology than high school science teachers, and two, is taking a whole bunch of graduate classes in biology, knows vastly more than the high school teachers do, and two, this poor, this poor guy's a graduate student. He's probably starving, you know? He's looking for work. So you can get him cheap. You know, I, I, I don't need that. I charge more money. But, uh, you know, you have somebody who's, who's never taught before, uh, but they know the subject. And, you know, they, uh, it's in their self-interest. They can get, you know, 40, you get them for $40 an hour you know, or, or something. You, know, you get them inexpensively, and he knows the subject. Uh, and so... The, tu the tu tutoring, do it online, it's in everybody's self-interest. The grad student doesn't have to run from one college to another, like I did when I was in grad school, can sit in his living room or his dorm room you know, do, and make money at home. And it's his self-interest because he can build a resume, his teaching experience, does a good job with the kids. The parents give him a strong reference. It's in everybody's self-interest. But for the parents, they get people, yes, probably don't have a lot of teaching experience yet, but crucially, know the subject they can and they can get them inexpensive so tutoring is, is a very viable option so take your kids out of school homeschool maybe form a micro school some other parents in your community and rely on this huge available network of very intelligent college uh, students who are perhaps in graduate programs studying the content of the subject even if they don't have the education degree, what you're saying is the education degree is not all that vital. No, you can learn how to teach. If you know the subject, you can learn how, how to teach. If you know what to teach, you can learn how to teach uh, rel relatively quickly. You see what works and what does, doesn't work. Now for elementary school teachers, it, it, you know, they're going to be locked in a room with 25 little kids. You know, that's, that's a challenge. And I think for elementary school teachers, you know, they need to spend a lot of time, I think, in the classroom with experienced elementary school teachers to see how classroom management for them is, is critical. But when you, you know, when you, when you, uh, you know, when you, when the kids, but when you're homeschooling, you don't have that problem. You don't have 25 kids in the room. You generally have just a few generally just have a few kids uh, at a time. It's much easier. It's much easier to teach them. And you can, I've seen really good homeschools motivate their kids, get them up in the morning, get breakfast. And, you know, we're done breakfast done by nine o'clock and we will crank say from nine to 1230 or nine to one, you know, really rigorous academic subjects. And then we're done. You're, you're free for the rest of the day. You could go play, do whatever you want with your buddies, you know, but let's crank, you know, for three or four hours right now. And a lot can get done when you, you motivate the kids in that way and, and, you, and you really push them. 
academically and they know, hey, get this done and then I'm going to go, you know, my friends and I are going to go to, you know, go to, go to the park and we're going to, you know, we're going to play football or whatever. And um, I, yeah, I've seen homeschool moms, generally moms, sometimes dads, but, you know, do a, do a really good job with their kids. And there's so many resources now, Sean. There's so many homeschool networks. There's so much material online, curricula and, you know, and organizations to join of experienced homeschool parents to get advice on what to do and what not to do, how to teach math to young children, how to teach science to high school kids, you know, so on and so forth. There's so much available now. It's such a widespread phenomenon. And good homeschool parents, they go, they, you know, they have their own time. They go on field trips, they go to museums, they go, you know, they, they travel and they, you know, and they, when they travel, they'll mix in education with fun. You can go to Rome, you know, and they'll go, they go to the Colosseum and, and mom or dad will discuss the history, you know, of the Roman Colosseum with, with the kids. There's very, there's a whole bunch of different ways to mix, uh, uh, to mix in homeschooling with childhood activities and fun and fun activities. But here's the, here's the key thing. Let me just say one more thing. Uh, here's the, the single most important cognitive skill is reading. And it's very simple to teach your children to read. It's very easy. Uh, you know, unless the poor kid's brain damaged. You know, the 99.9 something percent of the population could learn how to read easily by the time they're four years old. And for the first thing to do, here's what I do with my daughter when she was two. We used to go to the park and you know, we play or have all kinds of, do all kinds of games and fun stuff. And part of the fun stuff was we'd go to the bookstore or the library and she would pick out a book. It's important parents let the child pick out the book because the first goal here is to show the child that reading is fun. And so my daughter would pick out, you know, she was two. She'd pick out books, you know, about dogs that could fly or kittens who thought the full moon was a bowl of milk, you know, goofy stories like that. But to her at two or three, it was fun. And so I'd read it to her. And you do that regularly and the child learns, well, reading's fun, there's cool stuff in books. I want to learn how to read. I don't want to have to rely on mom or dad or a teacher. And then by the time the child's four, using systematic phonics, you can teach her or him to read in a matter of weeks. Motivated child, by the time she's four or he's four, can learn to read in a matter of weeks by four years old. Uh, and so five at the latest. And then the whole world of knowledge is open to the child. And any parent can do this. It's the single most important cognitive skill and any parent can do it and do it easily. That's incredibly powerful advice. And it's certainly, yeah, we've actually talked about this a little bit because you were, you came and visited me and we went to the bookstore and we sort of had this experience. Yeah, in together. Franklin, in Franklin okay. Massachusetts, right? That's right. <laughs> First town ever named after Benjamin Franklin. I hope everyone that, that's in yeah, high school too. in Franklin knows too, that. Yeah, yeah, I do too, but I, I would doubt it. <laughs> and so I hope that the, the implications and the connections between this subject and human flourishing are absolutely clear to everyone listening to this show. But Andy, I did want to give you an opportunity to say anything you'd like to about that connection. There's, there's so much to say. Uh, on behalf of a good education. First of all, uh, I, I, I saw you quoted Aristotle in your, you know, in your piece on, on Brazilian politics, you know, that we're the rational animal and rational animals need to learn how to think, you know, just like birds need to fly, you learn to fly and, you know, and little lion cubs need to learn how to hunt and everything. Human beings need to learn how to use their rational faculty. And when we do that, it opens up literally the whole world to us. First of all, we, you know, we, we're much more prepared for a career. If we have sharp thinking skills, reading, writing, and math, math skills, uh, you know, we're, we're much better prepared for a career you know, in, in, in any number of fields. But there's so many other things. Let me give you an example. I won't mention the guy's name. Here's a guy, you know, I was a basketball player as a kid. I'd hang out in the schoolyards you know, in Brooklyn playing basketball. And, you know, you'd rub elbows with all these different kind of guys. Here's one guy who's a grad student getting a PhD in, you know, sociology. And another one's a weekend warrior. He's got a family, but he's out on the weekend to play ball. Another guy's a drug dealer. You know, it's just this whole, this whole range, this whole range of people. Uh, 
And one of my friends, I, I tried to avoid the drug dealers used to come on the court with pistols in the waistband or their cutoffs. But um, uh, one of my friends, I won't mention his name, but he was a bus mechanic. And he was a very good bus mechanic. And you can see- Bus you, mechanic. Yes, oh, yeah, the mechanic who worked on buses. <laughs> and uh, um, you could see a couple of good things about that. First of all, there's great satisfaction in repairing something that's broken and making it work again. You know, you're, you're building something, you're constructing, you're creating, you know, you're building. It's, it's very, it's, it's great fulfillment in that. And second of all, as a bus mechanic, he's making a lot more money than I'll ever make teaching philosophy. So those are two, those are two good things. But he went to Kingsborough Community College in his spare time. You know, took one course a semester, took him, you know, a few years to get his associate's degree. And then he went to Brooklyn College, same thing, took him, you know, took him like eight or 10 years altogether to get a bachelor's degree in liberal studies. And uh, he told me his buddies in the shop, he'd come in, this is back in the days of, you know, of LPs, before, you know, before CDs. But then vinyl's coming back, isn't it? I think vinyl's coming back. It is. I have, I have the record player, yeah. Yeah. You know, so he had the, the vinyl, you know, of uh, Beethoven's Ninth or something. He's ca carrying a copy of, you know, uh, Crime and Punishment, you know, the reading in their English classes. And his buddies would ask, what are you doing with, with this stuff? You're a bus mechanic. And my friend told them, he said, I'm a bus mechanic. Doesn't mean I have to be an uneducated bus mechanic. And you know, it had that, there's wisdom. You know, there's wisdom there. I can appreciate it. So I'm a really good mechanic and I'm, got all the satisfaction of repairing things and making good money. And I also, I could also listen, you know, to Chopin's piano music and appreciate the beauty of it. And maybe I like the Stones also, you know, it was a popular band back then, but, you know, I could listen to Beethoven's piano sonatas and appreciate. It. And, you know, I, you know, I like superhero comics, but, you know, I could read Dostoevsky too. And I could go to, you know, the Royal Shakespeare comes and puts on Cyrano de Bergerac on Broadway or Hamlet or whatever. And I can appreciate these, these great works of art. It enriches, you know, it enriches your life. Uh, and then we are discussing history before, you know, most people are interested in current events as, and, uh, you know, as, 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 as voters, they, they listen to the presidential debates and everything. Like I said before, we cannot understand current events without uh, a knowledge of history. And it's heartbreaking how little American history People know they don't know that country was founded on the principle of individual rights, and they don't know the principle of individual rights led to a viable abolitionist movement, and that 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 the abolitionist movement led to the Thirteenth Amendment abolishing slavery in eighteen sixty five. They don't know all these great things about America. They just hear the how horrible you know the leftist propaganda, how horrible America is, and they don't have the intellectual means to combat it. They don't understand America, what makes it special, their own country, uh, and so. Understanding current events, you know, is, is impossible without history. Um, and, you know, go to the movies, you know, I'll go with, you know, with my girlfriend and, you know, after the movie, you know, we'll, we'll discuss it. And, uh, you know, I know something about literature and I, and I know something about history and I could bring, you know, I could br bring this material to it. I just, do you, do you remember Oliver Stone's film, JFK? Never saw it. All right. Well, I just rewatched it the other night. It's it's a powerful movie, artistically very well done. Now, I think Oliver Stone played fast and loose with the facts of the case, but I read Jim Garrison's book a long time ago. Jim Garrison was a New Orleans DA, who, you know, who uh, uh, claimed that there was a conspiracy to kill Kennedy, and uh, and he brought he brought one of the, what he considered the co-conspirators to trial, late sixties. The guy was acquitted. Clay Shaw, his name was, but Garrison brought a lot of evidence into the trial showing that there were more than three bullets fired. And I think he's right. He had a lot of evidence to show there were more than three bullets, which means that there was at least a second shooter, that there was a conspiracy to kill John Kennedy. And I think he's right on, on this. And if you, know, if, if you have this kind of cultural awareness, you know, and you read books and you have education and you could examine not just movies, but you know, this is a major event in American history, the assassination of President John Kennedy, uh, you know, it's 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 nice to to be a reader, you know, and and to be able to read the books on the Kennedy assassination, possible conspiracy, and any number of other topics. You bring 
so much knowledge to bear to current events, to interpreting movies, to uh, you know, you know, listening to presidential debates, and you know, and you, and yet you don't know. Let's say if you don't know that President Reagan was whatever his flaws was instrumental in helping to bring down the Soviet empire, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall, you know, put a lot of moral pressure on the Soviet plot. A lot, a lot of people today who are voters don't know, don't know any of this. Yeah. Uh, so with an education, it literally opens up your, your understanding of the, you know, of the entire world. Well, this has been a lot of fun. <clears throat> I'm going to take a lot of these principles into parenthood, and I hope a lot of other parents or will be parents uh, can do the same. Check out Andy's book, Why Johnny Still Can't Read or Write or Understand Math and What to Do About It. The What to Do About part is really, really cool. I've been digging into this stuff and thinking about how I'm going to apply it. And uh, thank you so much for, for writing this book and for coming on the show to talk about it. Oh, it's great, John. Thanks very much for having me on. It's always fun talking to you, especially about the vital field of education.